Welcome back, my friends, to the Mail Right Real Estate Agent Podcast Show. This is episode 127, and our guest today is Liat Siegel, and she is with Hadar Interior Design. And I'm going to let her introduce herself. But first, Liat, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Will you tell? Oh, you're welcome. And will you please share with our audience a little bit about yourself, uh, uh, what you do and, and how you do it? Sure. Sorry, my kids are probably, <laughs> you can hear them in the background screaming. <laughs> um, yes, I am Liat Siegel from Hadar Interiors. I am an interior designer um, and I work with uh, hotels to help, help them set themselves apart from the competition. Um, I also help restaurants and um, other uh, businesses in the in the hospitality industry um, creating an experience a one-of-a-kind experience um, for their guests nice and then I would imagine that carries over to the real estate community too right definitely um, it's really incredible how when you create that experience that online to offline experience um, where consumers buyers will know what they're getting um, before they even step into the space. And then when they actually come in the sp into the space, it's consistent with what they saw online. Um, it just makes the sale that much faster, that much easier, and you can potentially um, sell it for the home for more money. Yeah, there's, there's a... Um... There's a big problem uh, between what people see online in photography and what they walk into. Um, kind of like the same experience they have with their realtor when they see a photo of them online and then the actual realtor shows up and they're 15 to 20 years older than that photo. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but, yes, that's exactly so what it, it builds, is. It builds more trust if they walk in and, hey, what I'm seeing on my screen is right here in front of me. It matches. It's, it's not a trick photography. Yep. Um, what well, we're going to dive into some questions. Um, I, I have um, three sets of questions for you from three different areas, um, but I want to let Jonathan introduce himself, my illustrious co-host. Jonathan, welcome to the show and say hi to everyone. Oh, thanks, Thomas. So, yes, I'm the founder of Mail Rights. We're a platform that gets quality leads um, to our clients, which are real estate agents and professionals with an emphasis on Facebook. Back to you, Thomas. And I'm Thomas J. Nelson. I'm a residential realtor with Big Block Realty here in America's finest city, San Diego, California. All right, we're going to get back over here with uh, some questions because I want to cover a few things. I want to talk about design. I, I also know that you um, have a lot of uh, expertise in Facebook marketing. And then I thought we'd wrap it up with talking about the work-life balancing act that we all do as professionals, especially uh, small business owners. Um, that I have families. <laughs> so, yes, I balance it all. <laughs> yeah. So let's start with interior design. So, uh, and this is the chicken and the egg question. What came first? Uh, were you working with realtors first or are you working with hotels and restaurants first? So it, neither really. Huh? Um, <laughs> I um, started off working in the residential arena. Um, I still do some of that, but um, I was really, Facebook, um, Facebook really, Facebook ads really helped me to focus my niche and helped me um, understand my strengths and what I'm able to deliver best for my clients. So, you know, I would, I would um, do my ads and I would try to get the target audience right. And I would have my content and it just, wouldn't work. And then I'd go and I'd tweak and I'd do it again and again and again until I had to dive so deep and ask myself questions over and over and over again until I was able to um, uncover um, what my, my niche specifically was. And in that process, one of those um, niches that I explored was the real estate industry. And because I'm a very, uh, I'm very business focused. I have a, you know, I'm not just an interior designer. I have that business mindset. So I understood that having quality design in a space increases the ROI. Yep. Um, so, yeah. Well, I think, <laughs> okay. So we'll, we'll kind of blend the, the first two topics because you brought up Facebook and um, I think it's interesting that 
uh, trying to create a better, uh, more effective Facebook ad actually taught you more about who you were as a designer and who you're actually trying to connect with. Uh, right. Because I, I think that's one of the big mistakes we make uh, as entrepreneurs, not, not just realtors, but we want to serve everybody and everybody we can't possibly serve. So we have to drill down. But then we have that fear of, well, if I focus on this, I'm missing out on that. Right. But if you're all over the place, you're really not really, it's like, you know, trying to throw, you know, seven fishing poles in the water, but you only have one person man in the poles. Eventually something's going to get away anyhow. So you might as well focus. Right. Correct. Well, I just want to say something. I think the both of you have just made an enormously powerful point about it's very counterintuitive, isn't it? Um, that to be effective, you need to actually niche a fire and, not to appeal to everybody, which is exactly. enormously counterintuitive, isn't it? It is. I, I was recently interviewed on ESPN radio, and I remember when they asked me to introduce myself, I had this sick feeling in my stomach as I only <laughs> mentioned one neighborhood in San Diego and one demographic because wow. I really felt, okay, if I'm going to hit this audience, I, I wanted to have them focus and, and if I tried to tell them five different neighborhoods and, and six different demographics, I'd lose them. So I had to practice what I preach. But even though I knew it was the right thing to do, it still felt horrible saying, because in my mind, I'm going, I, I only limited it to this neighborhood and this age group. Um, exactly. So how, how it's painful, but it's really important. It means you're doing the right work. Yeah, exactly. So the, so now the, um, so Working residentially led to working with uh, residential realtors, and, and then that led to more of your commercial work? Yes. Okay. So one of the challenges, and, and I, I'm sorry, are you, are you based in New York? Do I have that right? I am, yes, oh, okay. with offices in Texas as well. Oh, okay. So you, you, you uh, jet set between the two? We just um, started a partnership with a construction company out in Texas to help with their rebuilding efforts after Hurricane Harvey. Oh, wow. So our plan is, yes, to be going back and forth. Nice. Well, I, I don't know, and I don't know if you've um, been in Texas long enough to, to assess how they receive interior design, but um, I would imagine in New York, it's probably um, seen uh, with a, more of a value than I've seen Californians uh, receive it because I know so many uh, of my listings I've tried to encourage the um, either working with what they have or um, bringing in furniture to a vacant house to define the rooms and it is such a hard sell with people because yeah. they don't see the value in spending the money um, how do you address that yeah, it's a really, really awesome question. And that's where I think that I was so excited about serving the real estate um, mark industry. Because if you come to it from a business ROI perspective, it's a no brainer. If you look at the stats and you look at um, the Real Estate Staging Association, it's undeniable. When you stage a home, you can sell it for 90% faster, a 90% faster, and you can make you know, um, much more money, more than the asking price. So when you present it that way, um, it's clear as day that that is, you know, whether whatever the notions are about interior design and, and um, how much it's going to cost or not, it's in the facts um, are there um, and speak loudly that if you spend a little bit, you make a little bit of investment up front, even as the real estate agent yourself, like yourself paying for an interior designer to come stage your home, um, it's, you're going to make that money back. Well, and let's, let's unpack that a little because what, what, you're, what you're saying is if I invest five grand maybe on a couple months of uh, good staging and decor, Mm -hmm. what essentially, how am I going to make the more money? Well, because more people are going to be interested in the property. The, right. the fact that there's more interest is going to create an urgency, which there's your 90% faster factor yeah. mm -hmm. because now they're, 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 they're going into that multiple offer situation, which is how we raise prices. So essentially if I spend the five grand uh, or whatever the, uh, I'm picking an arbitrary price, um, but I make 10 grand on it even, I mean, that's like going and putting 5,000 down in Vegas and doubling your money in one roll. So yes. 
but I would imagine for you the challenge is because we as realtors are challenged selling this to our clients and now you've got to sell it to realtors who are doubting it because their clients are doubting it. So you got to get through to the consumer, but your gatekeepers in, in a lot of cases is the realtor. So what are you doing besides the stats? I mean, it, do you use before and after? Do you, do you have yeah. like, um, do, you, do you have like a portfolio of, of, um, of your past clients and you show them like, how does it work with your sales process for realtors? So basically number one is I, when I recognized that the issue was that the clients don't understand, I went right to the realtors. I was like, Hey, don't you want to make, don't you want to save on the, well, first of all, it's saving the carrying costs for um, the homeowner. But in addition, if you know, an average home, um, is on the market for a hundred days or whatever it is, nine, 90 to a hundred plus days. Um, and you want to sell that faster. Um, it's a no brainer for them to put down the money in order to make it back faster and to, um, have a return on that investment. So rather than selling it to the real estate agent, who's then going to sell it to the homeowner, I'm just, going directly to the real estate agent and telling them what the benefits are of them doing it themselves. That's number one. Number two is if you show them before and afters, um, it's also an amazing tool to help them understand just how, um, how much it increases the home's value. Um, and then, you know, just through my own marketing at that time, when I was working with the real estate agents, um, it was just doing some talks and helping them understand the breakdown. It's, it's, it wasn't so much of a sell for me. It was, you know, when I spoke to them, I was I told them all the facts. I broke it down. I showed them the before and afters and they were like, okay, I get it. You know? <laughs> well, I mean, and it makes sense. Uh, I, but so, but what you're coaching agents on is that they take on that cost instead of the client. Correct. Okay. And, and how's that being received? Um, so, so they understood it and they, you know, they, they understood that if they take on that cost, they're going to make it back quickly. I mean, in, for a real estate agent that isn't used to marketing, isn't used to implementing marketing strategies, it's going, the barrier to entry is much harder. Right. Somebody who's innovative, whatever age they are, whatever, you know, generation, if they're, if they have that innovative mindset, they're going to be like, yeah, I'm going to try it out because I'm going to set myself apart from the competition. No one's doing this. This is a space that, you know, that I can really um, position my, my firm as, you know, one of a kind. And then as a whole, maybe onboard new agents, you know, build your firm up to the next level and scale it. Right. So as a business decision, as somebody who's business focused is going to see this and understand the val the immense value, you know, put, it's basically spending this money up front with an interior designer is marketing dollars. So, and, and I, I guess what I'm seeing then is because the, the, what, from your example, the resistance would be, well, uh, well, I'm going to spend 5,000, but I'm only going to make 12. So I'm, I'm, I'm out the five. How is that helping me? But to your point, but if you're selling at top dollar or above top dollar or a market value, I should say, um, and selling faster, your reputation is going to precede you and you, what you're going to maybe lose in the initial investment, it, you're going to make up for in volume because the demand for your service is going to go up because Correct. you are setting yourself apart. Correct. And I, and I think that's important is we get too focused on what we're going to make per deal instead of looking at our quarter or our year and say, what, okay, instead of worrying about what I'm going to make per deal, what, how can I double my production? Correct. And, Okay. So well, I also I also think it's linked to our discussion last week, really, Thomas, where you were talking about the predictions for two oh eighteen from Buffini, Brian Buffini, where you say when you said to me the the buyer is still looking for real good value, is still edgy, you know, it's right. not as easy as people think in the, in the present market. And having a house that's properly presented that you 
uh, that also sells much quicker than the average is beneficial not only to your reputation as a professional agent, but to your bottom line, is it not? It, it is because the misconception right now is because it's still um, inventory wise, a seller's market is that you just throw a sign up and sell it. But um, I just closed a deal on a house that sat for 70 days. I brought the buyer in because it was overpriced for all the deferred maintenance. And my clients are like, well, look, you know, once I buy the house, I don't have the cash to do all these repairs. So why would I want to buy a broken house? And these sellers needed to reconcile this that right. 70 days on the market in this kind of market, it, the market's telling you something. And so, um, and, and it was partially furnished and partially vacant. So it was hodgepodge. Um, and I think it would have probably been a more attractive house if it had been staged consistently because my clients went back three times before they even wrote an offer because we were trying to figure out two of the rooms. Like, how do we, what is the purpose of this room, this giant room that seems to be just a thorough way from the kitchen to the front door type of thing. And I think that's one of the things that stagers and interior designers do is they help define a room uh, or even show people in an odd shape room how to set up the furniture. Because right. I've literally heard buyers say, I don't know how to set up my living room with this, you know, triangle living room. Yeah, definitely. And also what happens is that the people that are living there now have their home set up exactly the way that they want it and that, you know, right. they envisioned. And when you don't have the house set up in a way that the potential buyers can see themselves living in, then you're doing yourself and your bottom line a disservice because most people don't have that kind of imagination to, you know, when I go into a room, I automatically start moving furniture around without touching it. <laughs> like I, I can see how it can come together and what I can do and how I can, you know, paint in this color or put up beams over there. You know, I can see that, but for most people they can't. So by setting up a room, exactly like you're saying, the homeowner, the potential buyer is coming and they're seeing themselves in the space. And um, it's so powerful it's it's i don't have enough words to explain how powerful that is well and to your point i mean uh, like in my example i gave you've got um 60 something year olds selling a home to 30 something year olds there's a right. huge generation gap of you know furniture taste and and use of rooms i mean the the younger generation are not using homes the way uh, my parents used uh, a home you know, they, they're not interested in formal dining rooms and formal living rooms. They want great rooms. And then how do you, you give them a great room, but then if you don't stage it properly, it looks like a huge waste of space. Right. And, I, and I've never heard that term or that phrase more in the, than in the last couple of years where um, my younger buyers will walk in and go, wow, look at all the wasted space. And I, I'm, I'm, uh, it, it takes me back that they recognize that bec and it, but it's not, it's not a waste of space the way they built the house. It's the way they set up the room. Correct. They're not utilizing all the square footage. So it feels like, well, why am I paying for the square footage if it's just going to hold a plant? Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. Plants. We're going to have to go for our break folks. And when we come back, we're going to continue the discussion. We are always going to ask Leah, what is it like going on Rick's show, The Art of Pay Traffic, one of the leading Facebook podcasts at the present moment? And she had a one-on-one -on -one with Rick, which is um, interesting. So we'll be back in a few moments, folks. We're coming back. We've had a, a broad discussion about interior design, the power of staging, why it's still important. And I think now we'll probably go on to your interview with Rick on the art of paid traffic. So I'd, I'd like to start it off. Um, so um, was it really hard to get on his show? And what were some of the main things that you learned through that one-to-one? -one? Um, so I was in one of his recent courses for local Facebook ads, and um, they reached out to me to hear some of my feedback and my opinions and um, and I'm very, you know, free flowing. <laughs> so I'll give my opinions and talk whatever. And um, so they asked me to come on the show um, so that, you know, Rick could do an assessment of, um, of my, 
my results um, through his course. And um, it was really fun to be on the show and to speak to him one on one and get to hear his feedback. So what were some of the main things you think you learned through that consultation? Um, the number one thing, uh, which was a theme that kept on repeating itself, like I had said in the beginning, was um, content is king. You know, making sure that all of my content and how I was communicating to my target audience was consistent and was powerful. Right. So on reflection, do you think there was a lot of, you know, obviously it was obvious through the interview, um, there will be a link in the show notes, folks, to to that episode, um, that you were on reflection, even though you were spending a lot of time on Facebook, you weren't giving a co coherent message to your audience. A hundred percent. Yeah. Um, I mean, I know who I am but I didn't know who my clients were enough to use the proper languaging to um, create an offer that was right for them mm. and um, that was enticing enough for them. And something that a lot of, I see a lot of business owners do a mistake that a lot of business owners do is that, you know, we're in the beginning, especially as we're on understanding and um going on to the online world um, and of Facebook ads and, and marketing is that we are so desperate to make things work. Mm -hmm. And um, it seems so easy with all the courses that are out there and all the, um, the offers that are, you know, you can make money in 90 days or whatever it is um, that we're so desperate to make it work that we're just throwing ourselves out there and we assume what our clients want rather than asking them, what is it that you want? What is it that you're looking for? What are you struggling with? But really, really understanding, diving deep into understanding what they want and, um, and delivering that to them. So through, through that um, process, that's how I was able to really niche down and really understand. Now it's fluid, like it's one and the same for me. I understand completely, obviously not completely. There's always learning and growing, but um. I understand much more what my audience wants and um, and how to deliver it to them. I think the other thing um, that I got from the interview was that you were really struggling, str struggling. That's probably not totally the right word. Um, you having difficulties investigating, trying to find the right audience in the Facebook platform. And I, I like your thoughts around that because I think that's one of the hardest things about Facebook and using the platform is finding the right targeted audience. Correct. Yeah, that's definitely um, was one of my uh, biggest struggles. And um, also recognizing that it's not Facebook ads is not, even though I understand it and I understand the strategy, which is very important. Um, it's not one of my strong suits. <laughs> So I definitely, you know, as an entrepreneur, as uh, you need to reach out to other people that can help you do it, whether that means hiring an agency or, um, you know, really, really, really understanding how to do it. Um, otherwise, Facebook target audiences is, is uh, for me, at least it was very difficult. What brought you to Rick? Um, you, you mentioned you were a student of his. Had you tried other things or was Rick your first uh, venture into getting help with Facebook? So I have been learning about Facebook ads for a few years already and I've been trying to run them um, unsuccessfully. <laughs> and um, or shall I say successfully because I am where I am today because I learned so much. All right. The stepping uh, stones. Yeah. So so, you know, for his, the reason why I took his course was because it was focused on local ads. Um, and I felt that that was an area that I didn't know enough about um, how to target into the local, local audience versus, you know, um, online. Is that what led you to boutique hotels and restaurants? Was that a result of that? Um, I would definitely say that it had a huge impact um, going through the real estate arena 
and that together, those things. And then I had some other things also. I'm in um, um, a mastermind, a year long mastermind. And I had also another three month mastermind. And I had all these people around me that I was constantly talking to because I didn't feel that everything was aligned. I didn't feel that it was quite right yet. And just all these things and just understanding that there's an ROI to design really helped led me to wanting to work with hotels because that's ROI on a massive scale. Yeah. Now is that, I mean, are you doing lobbies or are you doing their restaurants, their rooms, everything? I mean, what, how are they engaging your services? So it's basically everything it's from wow. beginning to end. And also um, I'm coming in also as a strategist, helping them understand that, um, I, I created what's called the road method return on emotional design. Uh -huh. And, um, basically it's based on the principles that design, um, is an emotional, um, it's an emotional journey and you have to have touch points for your audience, whether it's in the real estate industry or it's in the hospitality industry, there has to be touch various touch points. So like I was saying from online to offline from the first time that they're visually seeing the space to the time that they come in and they feel the fabrics and, you know, they taste the fine wine and, you know, they, they um, go into the spa and whatever it is along the, their, their customer journey that it's consistent and it's, it's expressing what the brand stands for rather than just being a business that, you know, delivers a, a service or a product. It's this unforgettable experience now um, that sets you apart from any other business out there. See, what I'm seeing here, um, I'd, I'd be interested to see if you agree, and also Thomas, as you were talking, you were kind of describing a journey. You were, um, it, it was like, it was obviously that you were passionate about it and you had a lot of knowledge, but you also, you were drawing almost through language, a, a picture, a journey. Um, and what, what I think you're saying is that your Facebook marketing, your website, and all the other things you do online has to support that story, which you're, right. you're trying to tell to your a target audience that in the end would be interested in your products and services. Correct. Well, and I mean, what she touched on also was that uh, there has to be a consistency from start to finish. So it starts with what you see online. And then when you arrive and have that experience from using the hotel as an example, um, from check-in to room experience to restaurant and overall experience to check out. I mean, it, it has to be consistent. And, you know, we talked about this last week, Jonathan, where, you know, one of the keys to success is to stand out with your service in 2018, because there's, I mean, you go online now, there's how many hotels, there's how many realtors, there's how many interior designers, how do you set yourself apart? People right. got to be bragging on your service. They got to, the, the word of mouth and the, and the referrals come from the experience they have and then wanting other people to have that same experience because they care about them. And that's how the grassroots of this spreads. So what, what Liat's describing, although she was talking about a hotel, insert any business and they should be shooting for that same goal with their clientele. Exactly. And that is so, so powerful. Well, um, are we good on time or do we need to jump over to YouTube at this point? I think we'll wrap it up now. We yeah. go on and um, I think we'd, I'd like to discuss a little bit more about Facebook and what um, has been learned about using it. But, um, and also talk about um, this um, personal and um, business life balance because I think that's important as well, isn't it, Thomas? Yes, and and we have a mother of five. Is that correct? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so I think we have an expert here. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, for the purposes of our podcast, folks, we're going to sign off now, and uh, you, uh, we'll hope you'll join us over on YouTube for some bonus content. Uh, in the meantime, I want to thank Liat for joining us on our podcast. And Liat, will you share with folks how they can get in touch with you and learn more about you and your services? Yeah, definitely. You can uh, reach us at info at hadar h-a-d-a-r interiors with an s dot com 
Wonderful. And uh, you can also check out our website, uh, hadardteriors.com. And Jonathan, if folks wanted to get in touch with you for MailRite, how would they do that? I'll go to the MailRite website, mail-right.com. Um, you'll find all the interviews with show notes and other resources on the website. Go to our Facebook group, which um, we hope to get going in the new year. It's set up, but we need to do more work on that. And join the conversation. Join the tribe, as I would say. Um, we've got a loyal listener um, band of people, um, which is growing. So join that as well. How can people get a hold of you, Thomas? Well, I make it simple. They just go to thomasjnelsonrealtor.com or you can find me on Facebook uh, and I'm on Twitter and LinkedIn as well or do the old-fashioned thing and call me here in San Diego at 858-232-8722. I'm here as a non-sales consultant and, of course, for buyers, sellers, and investors in San Diego real estate. Uh, We thank you for joining us on this week's show, folks, and if you want to hear a little bit more, Come on over to YouTube now where we continue the conversation. Bye-bye. All right. So now we're on YouTube. And Jonathan, you had a question that you wanted to continue on the Facebook. Yeah. So, you know, obviously it was a short consultation with Rick. And, uh, you know, I think he tried to help you deal with the issues of finding the right targeted audience. But I think on reflection, there was slightly bigger I wouldn't say problems, but you, you, you you've done a slight pivot, and um, I can tell that you're very happy with that. But even with that pivot, has it been easy? And is that one of the reasons why you've hired a professional agency to try and help you find the right targeted audience? Um. So the question is, has it been easy? Um, <laughs> I, I feel I already know the answer to that one. <laughs> Um, it's definitely been more exciting and fun than ever before, which is why I know that I'm on, yeah. I'm on the exact path that I need to be on. Um, we even created, which I, you know, like the, the content is just flowing and it never, it, it was never like this before. So, um, it's really, it's really exciting um, that it's flowing and because it's flowing and because, you know, there are leads coming in and, and people are really resonating with what I'm saying and, and, um, what I'm offering. So I don't need to run my Facebook ads myself anymore. I don't want to, I want to do what I love to do and invite somebody else who's passionate about what they do onto our team to, um, to really help us serve more people. Yeah. Yeah. That's the big mistake. A lot of small business owners make uh, myself included in the early days. I think it's because we, when we come into our business, we can't afford staff. So we do everything ourselves and then we get used to that. And we don't realize that at, at some point we're making enough money to hire out third party help or our staff or team members and or we are control freaks and we don't want to give up the control, whatever yeah. the case may be. But uh, we've talked about this on the show before. At some point, you have to realize that in your business, there are $15 an hour jobs and there are $150 an hour jobs and so forth. And if you're spending your 150 hour time doing $15 an hour work, you're losing money every hour that you're doing that. So to mm-hmm. Liat's point is you're not being paid to uh, do Facebook ads. You're being paid to help redesign hotels and, and help realtors sell houses. And that's what you do best. That's what you're passionate about. So why would you spend all day being frustrated trying to figure out Facebook? Correct. That's exactly it. So uh, and you know, <laughs> I wanted to ask you both because um, I, I got to be honest, I, I don't know much about Rick and, and it sounds like um, it, it, he's a big deal in the Facebook community. So and I'm sure there's some other listeners that aren't familiar with him. Could you one of you tell us a little more about Rick and, and why he was such a powerful force to connect with? Shall I go or would you? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> um, well, I think Rick's, um, he's had a very long-standing podcast. Um, he lives in your town, actually. Uh, um, and so you might be able to uh, take him out for a coffee, Thomas. Uh, um, 
But um, also, he, he comes across as very knowledgeable, but a reasonable, uh, honest individual, doesn't he? Um, he's not... T- some, some of these on non-marketing types come across as... Um, to as I would put it, too much on message, and it also might be my Englishness as well. Um, that goes against my natural um, empathy, really, Thomas. But he, he tells really, um, and uh, he has some really interesting guests, and the b- basic um, information that he puts forward seems to be reasoning common sense because each advertising platform, Thomas, has got some unique features. And the thing with Facebook is people say you can really target, which you can, but all your other... um, If you're targeting problems, you are are advertising your problems. Does that make any sense, Thomas? I'm following you. I mean, but what you're trying to do is connect with other people's pain to solve it. You want to be the solution to their pain. Um, but, and just to be clear, um, we're, um, am I pronouncing his name right? Is it Rick Mulready or Mulready? Mulready. 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 I always struggle okay. with Because we keep saying Rick, but I just realized I don't think we've identified it. So our listeners might be going crazy. Like <laughs> Rick guy, <laughs> so, Rick Mulready at uh, Rick, Rick Mulready. 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 Mulready yeah. at Mulready.com. We just gave Rick a free plug. <laughs> <laughs> but just so we have a reference point for who we're discussing. Um, and he also does, um, which is very beneficial, you know, is his main income source. But it's um, he does he does these courses that are not, I wouldn't say they're cheap, but they're not ridiculously priced. And then you've got the option of going down and having a, a, like a two, three day course with him which is quite an investment but he's got a good balance of different courses at different price points hasn't he would you agree that like yeah and and he's very approachable also yeah okay um and just you know simple no nonsense kind of straightforward um a personable person <laughs> well you want that in, in a trainer because uh, i mean it's it's hard to learn from someone that you're struggling to connect with um yeah. Yeah. you know it, it's same in sales i mean it's that's why it's all about relationships still no right. matter how much technology we introduce speaking of facebook it still comes down to relationships i think of um he's one of the leading resources that's influenced me and also the the um jimmy and chris from curator um they have also influenced me so i would say they're two of the leading um resources that i have utilized and i've been on some rick's courses and i'm thinking of going coming down to one of his one-to-one small group courses as well um that they have been two of the main sources that influenced me um highly actually thomas okay well um with the time remaining i want to jump back over to liat and um something that we don't talk about much and i think we should um I'm always beating the drum about having time off and so that you have time with family. Um, and, and I've been pretty candid with our audience, Liat. I mean, I went through a divorce uh, 17 years ago in part because I was a workaholic. And um, so, you know, second time around, I'm very protective of my personal time. You're a mother of five. Um, you have a, a marriage and, and a family, um, yet it you're, sounds like you're getting a lot busier. So what are you doing to protect that time? And how do you, how do you structure your days and your weeks um, to keep your family at top of mind for, for when you're scheduling? That's such a great question. And I um, really appreciate you wanting to talk about it because it is something that is not spoken enough about mm. um, that, you know, being, protective of our time and our families is really, uh, really important. Um, I want to start off by saying that it's always a work in progress, that it's never perfect. And no one should ever expect that of themselves or think that if they're looking at somebody else, that it's perfect. Um, We are constantly as our personal family, we're constantly growing and learning and, um, Something that for us, um, I am of the Jewish faith. I am an Orthodox Jew. 
and um, we have the Sabbath and um, that day um, is family. That day is completely, there's no phones, there's no internet, there's no business talk. Wow. Um, we are just completely focused on one another and spending time together and enjoying. So, um, you know, whether you keep the Sabbath or you have another day in the week or whatever, where you can just com completely disconnect from everything and just focus on, on one another that, you know, that's amazing. Um, and really for us, it recharges us. Um, and during the week, it's tough because, you know, our business is really scaling right now and we're really growing. So, you know, it's not perfect by any means, but the desire is there. The desire for, um, to rec and the communication between my husband and I, and between myself and my children, you know, telling them and encouraging them to speak to me and tell them, you know, have, have them tell me what they're feeling and me explaining to them and expressing to them that I miss them and that I love them and that I'm, you know, I'm always thinking about them and, you know, calling my husband and getting to speak to the kids when I'm on the road or, you know, just, you know, video chats or whatever when I'm, you know, flying to uh, different states or whatever. So um, that constant communication and remembering, you know, the reason why we're in business, you know, what is it? What's the purpose, you know, um, and not getting lost is, is really key. Well, and that, I mean, I think the fact that you're doing that keeps the awareness there. So even when it's not perfect, um, it, you, you are working towards, uh, it, you, I mean, it, it's never perfect, but it, you're working towards it to, you know, or, or excellence, I should say, maybe that's more attainable, but um, and that's something that I, you know, I've, I've spoken with, with a lot of my networking groups um, that, um, I share with them the five circles of life and that, you know, we have family, spiritual, financial, business, and personal, and they're never in alignment perfectly. They're, they're, and Jonathan, you use the word balance, but that's the one I try to keep people off. It's not balance because balance suggests you're going to get there. It's a destination. It's balancing. It's an active, yep. organic thing um, that to- oh, I think you're so right, Dan. It's very similar to your website. Um, people say when the website's finished, and I look at them, and um, that, that is a sign. That is a real sign that I haven't really educated the client. Yeah. The client has been very resistant to the truth. Is that a, a website that is going to get any um, return on investment for you will never be finished because it's Correct. an ongoing project. Yeah, I I think we desire some sense of completion yes, or we do. And so you know we can go there done but yeah. you you can never really do that and so the Liat is your is your husband involved in your business or does he do something completely different Yes he's he's uh he's in our business he's also uh we homeschool our children as well so that helps um with that balancing <laughs> wanting to be close to them. I specifically have my office at home so I can be nearby. Um, but um, he, yeah, he, he is with the children and he also helps me um, in our business and in our partnership um, with the company in Texas. Nice. Also, okay. also online technology, like video conferencing, like with zoom, which is the platform that we're using at the present moment. Um, your website, um, online advertising in a way it can't totally um eliminate um the benefit of that one-to-one -one interaction which you get meeting a client in person but it also does help somebody um do a lot more without having if they're not got a hyper local business like your like yours really doesn't it yes Yes, I love tech. My entire business is run on Slack and softwares, interior design softwares. It's it's amazing. Yeah, it's. I mean, to your point, Jonathan. I mean, there's nothing that can replace the the in person. But I mean, I even notice like for our podcast uh, versus some other podcasts where it's you don't see the people, you just hear the conversation. Uh, it makes a huge difference in the dynamic. I think of our podcast because we get to see our guests. Uh, and we've had guests, you know, from the East Coast, from Canada, from Australia, <laughs> you know, and everywhere. So it's, it, it's kind of a fun way to connect with people. Um, and we're lucky that we have that. 
Um, I didn't realize you traveled so much for your business. So are you, you're doing a lot of out of state business as well besides Texas? Um, so that's our goal. Um, we have um, partnerships with a whole, whole ray of um, other businesses in different markets that kind of relate to interior design and you know um, it's it's really exciting um, and our goal is to do international as well wow yeah. so uh, do you have anything cooking in California yet <laughs> actually <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah. okay all right we'll need to talk then okay awesome <laughs> My interior designer, who we actually interviewed um, several months ago, just dropped a bomb on me, and she's moving back to Morocco. So I am, oh. yeah. Uh, so I'm I'm losing my interior designer when she's questioning me. Um, so uh, it'll be good to to know somebody new in the business, or not that you're new in the business, but new for me to connect yeah, with. Definitely. Um, yeah, I think uh, I think we better wrap this up. Yeah. And also, this is going to be our last show for 2017. Um, I just want to say, Thomas, that um, Thomas came on board. Um, has it been more than less than a year, or slightly over a year? It's it probably feels like ten years for you, but it's <laughs> it's been over. It's a little over a year. I, I think I was official yeah. last September. Um, Thomas, um, it's been a pleasure working with you on the podcast. I think we've grown the podcast. Um, Thomas has always been totally honest with me on my slight failings, but um, <laughs> and a lot, a lot, a lot of it's been true. But that, that's his polite that. English way of saying I'm a jerk sometimes. <laughs> well, I am, <laughs> I am as well. So, uh, I mean, I can, I'm just as jerk if I, um, um, but no, I do not believe that at all, actually. Um, no, but um, thank you so much for being my co-host. It's been a pleasure working with you. Um, you've made the show a lot more professional, um, and it's much appreciated. And um, we're going to take a break for a couple of weeks so um, over the Christmas period, but we'll be back in the new year, in the first week of the new year, and we'll have a show where we we'll look back on our fabulous guests. That's another thing. Um, I want to thank our guests for coming on the show and being our guests. Um, I always, and I'm, I think Thomas feels like this as well. We always try and make the experience pleasurable for our guests and um, we treat them as like they were guests coming to our home. Don't we try that, Thomas? Absolutely. I mean, it's, I mean, when you have people that are taking an hour out of their day for us, um, you know, we, we take that seriously. And uh, Liat, we know you're busy and a lot of our guests are really busy. So we uh, try to honor that by making, giving you a platform to shine a little because um, we're, we don't just take anybody on the show. Um, there's a standard and, and we want to share that with our audience though, because the whole purpose of the show um, to borrow from my mentor is to impact and improve their lives, both personally and professionally. And we rely on good people like Liette to come on the show and share their time and talents. So that no, I think, grow. and it's all been free, hasn't it, Thomas? And if I was an agent trying to learn something, I would listen to our podcast because I think we've, <laughs> I think, I think we've covered a lot of material, <laughs> haven't we? <laughs> well, <laughs> sorry, my uh, my upbringing doesn't allow me to pat myself on the back. <laughs> so I'll just I can say, pat you guys on the back. <laughs> <laughs> but let's uh, let's let Liad uh, one more time share with our uh, our viewers um, how they get in touch with you if they want to get connected with good interior design and if and if you're not serving their area, maybe um, you have a referral for them through a network um, that you're connected with. Sure. So, um, for a, for a large project, we do travel. So, um, that is something that I'd like to put out there for your free audience. And I can definitely, if it's a smaller scale project, um, that might require some remote work, I can try to do that as well. And if not, then I can definitely try to connect you to someone else that can help. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can reach us at info at Hadar Interiors, that's H-A-D-A-R Interiors with an S dot com or Hadar Interiors dot com. You can also reach us on LinkedIn. Well, and certainly if you're a resident of New York or Texas, uh, you, you've got a wonderful resource in Liette and her services. So uh, don't be shy and uh, we'll have all her contact information up on the show notes when the, the show posts in a couple days. So uh, 
Leah, thanks again for being on our show. We really enjoyed having you. Thank uh, you for having me. A pleasure. Uh, Jonathan, you want to uh, let people know one more time how to get in touch with you? No, really. I just want to wish everybody uh, a great Christmas with their families and have a happy new year. And we'll see you in the new year. Yep. Happy Hanukkah. Happy, Merry Christmas. Or as the English say, happy Christmas. Uh, happy <laughs> happy holidays. holidays to everyone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, you guys. We'll see you in uh, 2018. Thank you.